While a majority of home labbing takes place in nice indoor air conditioned spaces, there are times when you want to come outside, enjoy some fresh air, touch a little bit of grass while you're at it, and perhaps you just want to sit on your back patio and do a little bit of doom scrolling while you relax. Or if you're like me and you have Apple AirPlay enabled outdoor speakers, you just want to stream some music without the music cutting out while you walk around your backyard where the Wi-Fi signal might be weak. So while indoor wireless access points can reach outside to a certain extent, ideally it's better if you can install an outdoor wireless access point to get better coverage without having obstructions in the way. I'm going to be taking a look at an outdoor wireless access point from TP-Link. It is the EAP772 Outdoor. And if you're familiar with Unify products, it's very similar to the Unify U7 Pro Outdoor Wireless Access Point. I want to go over some of the specifications of these wireless access points to show you how similar they are and also where they are different and where TP-Link is trying to position itself uh, compared to Unify. And the first thing I'll mention before going into the specs is the cost. The cost of this wireless access point is going to be at least $30 to $40 cheaper than the Unify an outdoor wireless access point. So this might be a good cheaper alternative if you are already, especially in the TP-Link Omada ecosystem, or if you're considering going into that ecosystem as an alternative to Unify. And so let's take a look at the specifications. One of the standout features of this wireless access point is the fact that it has omnidirectional antennas, even on the six gigahertz spectrum. If you look at the Unify wireless access point, they have directional antennas for all three bands, the 2.4, 5, and 6 gigahertz, but they, they only do omnidirectional in the 2.4 and 5 gigahertz spectrum. If you're looking to put an outdoor wireless access point in a more centralized location, you may be better served by getting an access point which has omnidirectional antennas like this EAP772 has from TP-Link. Another interesting difference between these two access points is the fact that Unify is rated at IP67, while the TP-Link is rated IP68, which is a higher level of waterproofing, which it can be submerged continuously for a, a certain amount of period of time. So if you're in a really wet environment, that might, may or may not be important to you, but just uh, that's something to consider. Another interesting difference that I noticed on the spec sheet is the TP-Link has a GPS built into it. I'm not sure if the Unify has that. It's not li listed on the spec sheet. As far as the physical dimensions of both access points, they're almost this, about the same size. The Unify U7 Pro Outdoor is a little bit smaller in the form factor. I see the overall maximum power consumption is about the same between these wireless access points. The TP-Link might have two about two watts higher at its maximum than the Unify, so they're about on par with the maximum energy consumption that you could expect for these wireless access points. So six gigahertz won't be enabled on your outdoor wireless access point unless it is able to reach an AFC server to do a check to make sure you're in the proper region to be allowed to use six gigahertz because not all countries allow six gigahertz to be used outdoors or indoors, depending on, on where you are. Um, but in the United States, it's allowed to be used. When you purchase a TP-Link Amada EAP772 outdoor, you get the wireless access point itself. And you get a number of accessories, including a plastic wall mount plate, two metal rings so you can attach to a pole, some drywall anchors, and the weatherproofing coupler for the ethernet cable. There's also a template included for the wall mount, which makes it easy to figure out where the screw holes should be. There is an indicator on the plate so you know which direction is the up direction. Then you just slide it onto the access point like so until it doesn't slide any further. To install the weatherproof coupling, you just take the large piece and you can put the seal on the bottom part of the coupling. And then you can take the end cap and put it around the ethernet cable. And you can put the ethernet cable through the coupling. Then plug the ethernet cable into the access point and screw the coupler onto the access point. And the gasket should make a nice tight seal. And then there's two different size foam pieces that you can use depending on the size of your ethernet cable, as you can see here. Take the one that fits your cable the, for the appropriate size and wrap it around the ethernet cable. And then you can push it into the coupling, make sure it goes in between all of the fins. And finally, you can screw the end cap on to the coupling. 
The wall mount bracket is quite easy to install, especially if you're doing it on a deck like I am, because I don't even need to use the template, and I can just screw four screws in and I'm done. It's quite easy to slide the excess point onto the bracket and it holds it very securely. And here's the completed installation where you can see the ethernet cable I just kind of have drooped there temporarily. So I spent a lot of time speed testing this wireless access point because I was getting lower speeds than I was expecting for this for a Wi-Fi 7 access point because I tested two other ones from different vendors in the past and got you know higher throughput than this TP-Link and I noticed the download speed was a lot slower than the upload speed and I was trying to think of what the issue could be and I even retested one of my old Wi-Fi 7 access points and got the same kind of basic result. And so I was thinking there's something that changed in my network or my Wi-Fi environment around me. So, you know, maybe a neighbor or something fired up, some kind of, you know, something's interfering or whatever. But after struggling with this for a while, I got on a conference call with TP-Link to see what was going on. Cause I tried different Wi-Fi clients. I even bought a new Wi-Fi card. It is a different brand than what I had in different chipset just to try something different. And I found out something interesting. I never didn't even think about this across my mind because it's not doesn't seem to be a problem with the wired connections. Is I was hosting my speed test server and iperf server on a 10 gig connection on my Proxmox, one of my nodes on my Proxmox mini PC, and I'm testing from a 2.5 gig interface. And so TP Link said that because I'm on a 10 gig and a 2.5 gig interface, there's a mismatch in speeds and Wi-Fi is more sensitive to latency and packet loss and that kind of thing versus wired connections that sometimes that can cause issues when you're doing like high throughput speed testing like this. And they said enable like flow control when the network switch, which I did try that and it did help a lot. And so I got, I was able to get like 1.8, 1.9 gigabits in both directions, like pretty much equally, which is great. So I was thinking maybe I could get a little bit faster if I tried putting my speed test server on a PC that has a 2.5 gig interface and there's no mismatch in interface speeds. And when I did that, I was able to max out pretty much the 2.5 gig interface with my Wi-Fi 7 client, even without MLO. And TP-Link was said that MLO in, may not necessarily be beneficial for adding increased bandwidth on a 2.5 gig interface because it's already saturated, but it could help smooth out, you know, the performance and speed if like any of the bands are, you know, saturated or have an interference or anything like that. So MLO still has benefits, but I didn't think about that the speed without MLO could actually saturate 2.5 gig without even having the combined channels. Cause I thought you had to have both to actually saturate 2.5 gig link because I noticed in the past when I had MLO, it did help performance, but I still couldn't quite saturate 2.5 gig. And it's all because I was probably hosting my speed test server on a 10 gig interface, testing from a 2.5 gig interface and without having any kind of flow control on the network switch, it must be overwhelming, you know, the buffers on the switch or something like that causing an issue. I will make one note on if you enable flow control on a network switch is just be kind of test it out and see how it works. Because if you're in a high throughput environment where you just constantly have high throughput, enabling flow control might not be as good as doing something like quality of service controls because it'll send pause frames and stuff and it'll slow down potentially that high speed interface to a crawl if there's a lot of clients that are you know needing to be paused because it's overflowing buffers and stuff like that so but in a home network usage it might not necessarily be bad to enable it because if you're not generally fully saturating your network because i noticed if i had it enabled i haven't really noticed any like other speed losses because i'm not fully saturating my 10 gig interfaces all the time just keep that in mind that i'm not advocating it enabling flow control it might be simpler just to host your you know speed test server if you're doing these kinds of tests on a 2.5 gig interface if you're experiencing problems with lower than expected throughput to manage this wireless access point you can use the built-in web interface which has a setup wizard to quickly get you up and running with a single wireless access point and you can do this for any number of wireless access points but you would have to manage each access point individually to configure all of the wireless settings and other settings for each wireless access point. 
If you have several wireless access points and other hardware from TP-Link Omada, you're probably better suited to use the Omada controller. And this is a software-based or a hardware-based controller that you may use to centralize the management of all of your TP-Link Omada devices, which is very convenient. So full disclosure, TP-Link sent me this Wi-Fi access point to test and demonstrate to see how well it works. So I'd like to thank TP-Link for sending out this wireless access point and I may even have the opportunity as well to test out some other Omada hardware in the future and maybe do a full Omada hardware network build. Uh, so that may excite you guys that, that are in the TP-Link Omada ecosystem because it allows me to get familiar and more comfortable with using all of their hardware and their software controller and other devices so that I can learn more about it and even create guides and technical demonstrations and even answer questions that you guys might have if I happen to know the answer because I've played around with it enough. So I'm looking forward to those opportunities. So I hope you enjoyed this video on the TP-Link EAP772 Outdoor Wireless Access Point. And I hope you stay tuned for future content. Until next time, I'm Dustin Casto, signing out. I don't have these kinds of problems with wired connections.